Well, look, thank you very much, and thank you for getting out of bed uh, to come along this morning. Um, I varied the topic a little bit because I want to talk about how we got to where we are. Talking about the workup, well, that's sort of one slide, uh, but how we got there, what it means, and understanding that is actually more important. So we're going to talk about selection for lung transplant and cystic fibrosis, the workup and the waiting, and Rachel, of course, will provide her own uh, unique uh, uh, interest in that. Um, I do have a number of uh, potential uh, financial disclosures. I've done trials or doing trials with all of these companies, none of whom pay me, of course, so I have really no personal conflict of interest. Um, in many things in life, uh, the real crux, the decision-making point is the decision of whom to do this and whom to do that, when to do this, when to do that. Now, this is a bas relief that comes from the museum at the base uh, um, of a tower in, in Florence. And of course, it's the Arbiter Bibendi in ancient Rome. And the Arbiter Bibendi was a person who decided how much uh, water to put in the wine. Um, and of course, that varied during the feast. Uh, coming from ancient Rome, it was probably more important to decide how much wine to put in the water. Uh, Otherwise, they may not have died from lead poisoning, but that's another story. The first guidelines to teach us or tell us as a world, as a global community, uh, whom to transplant, when to transplant them, uh, whom to accept and whom not to accept, uh, was actually published in the American Journal of Spiritually Critical Care Medicine, of which I'm now associate editor, in 1998. That's a long time ago before some of you might have been born um, or thought of. And it actually had taken about three or four years of, of round table meetings at various conferences, a lot of bottles of wine to get to that point, which is probably, if you read it, you'll understand why. The second guidelines took another eight years to do. Uh, and by this time, the only two people left from the first two guidelines is Marcus Sten, a wonderful uh, physician from uh, Belgium who now, of course, is doing psychiatry. That's what transplant does to people. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and myself. So there were two people with a bit of uh, corporate memory. And we, at this stage, we were calling them guidelines, but said, well, really, it's a consensus report. And there's a difference between the two. And that was published uh, uh, nine years ago. The third consensus document comes, uh, has just been published in January this year. Uh, and there's a few people who carried on from the, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, document, uh, or sorry, the second document. But the point being is that now we recognise that although uh, this is consensus of people who um, have worked in the field for a long time, some, some, of, some people would say too long, um, the real problem is that, that we don't have an evidence base to make true guidelines based on the so-called grade criteria. So this is consensus. This is a bunch of people getting around saying, look, in my experience, and you try not to loud to listen to the person who shouts the most or uses the loudest voice. Maybe the person who tells the best jokes or the person who doesn't try to tell any jokes, be that as it may. What is a consensus process? Well, this was an initiative of the Pulmonary Council, had a couple of co-chairs, a whole bunch of people with infectious disease input. It had to be signed off by our standards and guidelines committee, by the board, um, and we used an external medical librarian to get together all the literature in the world, which was then reviewed by each of the groups. Each section leader had a responsibility. My responsibility was write the introduction, the, um, the conclusion, and make sure that nobody is too far off the track. Um, and we had a, a bunch of teleconferences, face-to-face -face meetings. We presented it at our annual meeting and eventually it was published. So there's a whole number of issues there in the, in the document, but I'm just going to focus today on those that are relevant for cystic fibrosis. Now, why is this document important and why am I hopefully not wasting your time talking about it? Because it forms the basis for the Transplantation Society of Australia New Zealand lung transplant criteria you will have seen that at least two of the people who, who um, uh, were on the consensus document come from Australia. And we have our local documentation, which really is very firmly rooted in, in, the, uh, con in the international document. 
And this uh, goes under the auspices of the National Health and Medical Research Council, who reports to the Ministry of Health. It's under the responsibility of the minister. So there's both federal oversights uh, to this, but importantly, and this is why, partly why I'm here today, uh, we as a group, as any service providers, are beholden to the Australian public, both singularly and severally. In other words, to each individual Australian and to each group of Australians. And this is why these sorts of documents are important and to take them through from go to woe. And they take years. So, what is this document all about? It's about assisting physicians and patients and carers about to identify who might be suitable for transplant and to send them along at the, at the appropriate time. Even physicians um, who don't work in transplantation need to know about these sort of criteria and be become familiar with listing criteria for, uh, for uh, lung transplant referral. And this is very important for your CF uh, caring physicians and most, let me say most of them are uh, because we work together in the main. Now, referral for transplant and placement on the waiting list, they're two distinct processes. And the, the general agreement, referral to a program should occur early in patients who have a lung disease that is amenable to transplant, such as cystic fibrosis. What does that do? It gives the transplant program maximal flexibility in performing a formal evaluation and in making the second more important step of placing that patient on the active list. So how do we use the consensus? Well, um, what we need to do is work out the timing so that the patient isn't exposed to the risk of a transplant until all other viable treatment options are exhausted. That's generally t almost taken for granted with cystic fibrosis because we have very good CF teams working with patients. Listing a patient for a transplant is an explicit acknowledgement that a patient has a limited life expectancy and without trying to focus on, on negative aspects of what we do, transplant is a, is a therapy which is for people who have run out of medical options and it looks like they're dying. It's very difficult to say how long somebody will survive. We, we're not ma magicians, we don't have a crystal ball. But the perception has to be that the risk-benefit ratio favours lung transplant rather than conventional medical treatment. So the decision is complex. Uh, it reflects consideration of the individual patient, the psychological aspects, and program-specific factors. But referring a patient should not be interpreted either by the patient or the physician as an automatic endorsement of listing, either at the time of referral or, eight or afterwards. Referral should really imply the patient has met a minimal clinical characteristic that might warrant consideration for transplant. So where do we think about transplant? Well, patients who have end-stage disease, high likelihood of dying within two years, high likelihood of survival if they get a successful transplant. And that's, the, that's what we look for, people who will get benefit above the risk. Now it's a complex therapy. It's got significant perioperative morbidity and mortality so you have to look at the sum of contraindications and morbidities. So obviously somebody's got a recent malignancy, we're not going to help them with a, with a transplant because once you immune suppress somebody, that malignancy will no longer be under local control. So we look for a five year disease free interval. That's maybe not that relevant for CF, but I just mention it because there aren't many absolute contraindications, thankfully, for transplant untreatable significant dysfunction of another major organ system, heart, liver, kidney or brain. Well, we can do heart-lung transplants and we've done that for cystic fibrosis. And we have people who are alive at least 25 years after heart-lung transplants. Um, we've done liver-lung transplants, so that's not an absolute contraindication. Um, we haven't done any kidney lungs here, but we're working somebody up at the moment, no reason you can't do it. Brain transplants, well, that's something for the future. <clears throat> so we look for people who, um, who don't have uncorrectable bleeding problems, uncorrectable atherosclerotic diseases, and thankfully most of these are very rare in CF. But infection is not rare, 
Very few people have active M. tuberculosis, but they may have Mycobacterium abscessus. They may have some chest wall deformity. Very few of them have morbid obesity, uh, thank goodness, although I have seen one. Now, non-adherence to medical therapy or a history of repeated or prolonged episodes of non-adherence is an absolute contraindication. Because if you cannot look after your, your care before transplant, it is more difficult after transplant because you have a greater complexity of medications and follow-up. Psychiatric or psychological conditions associated with the inability to cooperate or understand or follow care will also doom somebody to failure. It's not helping somebody if we do a transplant on them and they're well and then within a few months they stop taking all the medications, don't, don't come for follow-up, etc, etc, etc. The patient doesn't get a benefit. They go through all that waiting and that listing, all that pain, uh, that experience, and they don't get the benefit. Substance abuse or dependence. Well, we like people not to be active substance abusers. And of course, sometimes that depends how hard you look. Um, alcohol, tobacco, THC or other illicit substances. We test for some, but not all of these. And what we look for is evidence of risk reduction behaviours, meaningful or long-term commitment to independence from substance abuse. Rachel will talk about that later. Was that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mum. <laughs> what are the relative contraindications? Well, we, we, we transplant very few people over the age of 65 with cystic fibrosis. Um, progressive or se severe malnutrition, thankfully, is almost always managed very proactively by our, our CF medical units. Severe symptomatic osteoporosis can be a huge problem, but once again, most of our CF units now are managing this proactively. It's an interesting thing. The world did not understand how severe osteoporosis was in patients with cystic fibrosis until they started living longer and having transplants. And that really caused a quantum shift or a phase shift in the way we approached it. Mechanical ventilation selected patients with other acute or chronic or without other acute or chronic organ dysfunction may be transplanted successfully. The important message here is don't wait till your patient, your relative, your son, your daughter, uh, needs mechanical ventilation or ECMO support, ECLS. Um, that's really putting them up for a, a no-win situation or a minimal win situation. So, infections are important. And if you have some relative contraindications, the larger centres do it better. A number of mycobacteria can be transplanted successfully. If you've got chronic extra pulmonary infection, you know that will get worse. If you've got hepatitis B or C, we, we do not, we, we manage that, we treat that, you can still be transplanted in, in centres with experienced liver units. So, let's come to HIV. We now do not, out of hand, exclude patients with HIV infections, particularly in units that have um, experience with the pharmacology of the drugs that are used to treat HIV-infected individuals. Infection with Burkholderia, Cenocepatia in particular, and multidrug-resistant Mycobacterium abscessus is not an absolute contraindication, but in most units in Australia it is, because we haven't had success in the main in treating patients with those conditions. We've had isolated successes, um, I should say. But those patients should be evaluated by centres with experience. We'll just pass on with that. So previous surgery is not a contraindication, nor is previous pneumothorax or pleurodesis, because the basic dominant factor here is patients have to survive till they get their transplant. You have to manage the pneumothorax or the infection um, uh, as you would in other ways. Mechanical bridge to transplant, Transplant may be recommended for younger patients who have single organ system dysfunction and a good potential for rehabilitation. And we've done that about 18 times now. The, the bridge success suggests that you, know, you need to be experienced with that and there's a 
there's, uh, I think Brenda Button um, uh, on Tuesday will be talking about this from her experience uh, on her church, church or fellowship, so I recommend that to you. So when do we refer with cystic fibrosis? As a single number, if your FEV1 is less than 30% or rapidly falling, that's a very important key. Um, particularly if you're female. That's not because we like transplanting young females. It's not a gender bias. The, in fact, it's a response to um, uh, the fact that young females with cystic fibrosis have a higher mortality on the waiting list once their FEV1 gets to 30% or less. And Peter Phelan's group in Melbourne has shown that very well with epidemiological studies. So it's a response to the fact that if your FEV1 is 30% and you're female, maybe it is uh, 0.6 of a litre, whereas if you're male, it might be 1.2 because you have bigger lungs. So that it's uh, just a biological reality. If you can't walk far and you're getting pulmonary hypertension, um, if you're having more frequent exacerbations, spending more time in hospital, if you've had acute respiratory failure requiring non-invasive ventilation, if you're developing more resistant organisms, if your nutritional status is worse despite all the tricks that people can do, if you're having recurrent pneumothoraces, if you're having life-threatening hemoptysis despite bronchial embolisation, if you have chronic respiratory failure with hypoxia, with hypercapnia, despite if you're on chronic non-invasive ventilation, if you have pulmonary hypertension and your WHO functional class four, short of breath, on minimal exertion or at rest. Now, the Canadians um, in this month's edition of the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant, published uh, three days ago, in fact, um, showed their uh, overall survival after transplant for cystic fibrosis and saying this is the best in the world. One year over overall survival, 87, five years, 66, 10 years, 50. I've just put in red there I had the time to pull out the St. Vincent's figures. Um, anyway, uh, we'll just uh, go to... Uh, look, I'm an editor of the journal. It's OK. Don't worry. <laughs> I've seen all the data. It's true. Um, patients with Burkholder acepatia is always a problem organism. Uh, we've got patients who've survived and continue to survive with a very good quality of life, despite Burkholder acepatia Sinocepatia, um, bacteremia, despite uh, uh, post transplant infections, but we've also had people who haven't uh, been successful. It's, it's a major problem. At the present time, we are not actually taking on board people with active sinocepatia infection. The blue shows you what happens in Canada if you've had sinocepatia, and the red is those who didn't have it. Um, so, every graph tells a story, but the message is that the one year survival is only about 60% if you've got cyanosepation. Um, so we evaluate all patients for cyanosepation. Species other than cyanosepation, we will we'll take on the list um, and we accept that they have increased risk of mortality and if they're going to be done, they need to be done at centres with a particular interest in those organisms. I just mentioned briefly paediatric candidates, Al almost the same criteria, poor quality of life, short life expectancy. And remember that smaller children um, will wait longer because we don't get many small donors and you have to fit the foot into the glove or the hand into the shoe or something like that. Anyway, um, <coughs> let's talk about the workup. As I said, this is really the easy part we have a list of, of things to do. It starts with a comprehensive history and an exam examination. It's all about knowing your patient, talking to them and understanding them. And that's not just done by one person. It's not just done by the doctor. It's done by the nurse, you know, by the referring clinicians, the referring CF specialists, their physios, their nurses, all people involved with their care. It's done at St. It's Vincent's or the hospital that they go to by their psychologist, the psychiatrist, the, the surgeons who do occasionally talk to our patients, um, and everybody. 
you have a number of blood tests. Well, this is simple. It, it's just looking for organ system dysfunction. We do viral serology to stratify risk. What viruses and infections have you had? What, what do we need to vaccinate you against? Um, we do some imaging to sort out where we are. We image just about everything except for the brain. We culture everything we can culture. And we do functional assessments to get a baseline or if you've already had a baseline to see whether there's been a change. We do nutritional assessments. Most CF centres will send that along. And you have family and psychological assessment. Good outcomes from CF transplant depends on the family, depends on psych psychology. That may be, if for an adult, it may be their partner, uh, occasionally their children. Um, people are getting older uh, with, with CF transplants now. We look at your HLA status to determine whether you have preformed antibodies. Unfortunately, if you're a female and you've had pregnancies or if you had blood transfusions, you will have more preformed antibodies to other, um, uh, to other human beings. And what that means is that you've got, you're carrying something that says you don't like and you'll make an antibody response to uh, a particular donor. So when we do the cross match, we, um, we make sure that uh, we don't uh, put you up against somebody to which you've already got a preformed antibodies. A lot of the work up is education, uh, transplant coordinators, social work, we have medical surgical review, and then a lung transplant listing meeting review. Sometimes it's really straightforward. Sometimes the review um, panel sits around and talks backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And, you know, it, it can be a difficult decision. And of course, Rachel's going to talk to us. I haven't been taking up all of her time. And uh, Rachel helped us out shortly after a transplant at our life ball. Um, I don't know who this fellow is, but this is the real star of the show. And so what is the active list? Uh, well, once you're on the active list, it means that lung transplant can occur at any time. Uh, that night, the next day, and sometimes that happens. Um, you have ongoing medical review, at least on a monthly basis. We do cross matches monthly. Many patients will have a dry run. They get called in and then get sent home. Sometimes they can even go to theatres. They might even have lines put in. I can think of one patient who actually had their chest opened before uh, uh, being sent back. And of course that's associated with multiple emotions. The active list, there's initial excitement phase. If you're not afraid, then you're not human. If you don't have despair sometimes, you're not human. But almost all patients on the active list are transplanted eventually. Sometimes we have to remove patients from the active list um, because uh, you know there's been a deterioration that would preclude us from transplanting them safely. Um, that may be temporary or it may be permanent. Um, sometimes it's because the, that's what the patient wants. One of our tra um, I'll share with our Queensland people. One of our patients that we, trans we put on the list when she was 17 uh, improved uh, and said to us, look, uh, Alan, I, um, this was in 1993, uh, I, I want to go off the list. Um, and I said, OK, fine. So she was off the list for a year. We transplanted her um, in 1995. That was 20 years ago. Uh, she's married. She's got a, a wonderful child and she lives a very good quality of life. We don't prejudice people who recover or have a honeymoon period of being well once we put them on the list. Uh, it can happen. <coughs> so it may be a positive development, you know. Of course, there are a newer uh, CF therapies that you probably know more about than I do uh, that cost a lot of money that, uh, that really can improve outcome and quality of life for patients with CF. And uh, there's at least one patient from our John Hunter group who we had on the list, went on this new drug, and she's now wonderful, uh, and she's not back on the list. So, in summary, <clears throat> we talked about specific recommendations, timing of referral, timing of listing, and also bridging to transplant with mechanical circuitry device and expanded indications for lung transplant. In the old days, we looked for reasons <coughs> why not to transplant somebody. Now we look for reasons to say, how can we do it and how can we do it successfully? So some positions are immutable. Transplant is a treatment of last resort, but early referral allows proper evaluation and education. And 
activation is a tacit agreement that Transplant offers a significant individual survival advantage. Take home messages if you've listened to nothing else. It's really too early to talk about transplant, but it may be too late. Building bridges is important. Building bridges with your referring team, with your transplant team, with every member of the team. And this is a team effort Australia-wide. We meet Australia-wide. We all try to do, offer the same quality of care, but importantly, importantly, equity of access to care throughout Australia. There was a time when there was one transplant unit in Australia and then there was two, and three, and four. Uh, but we now offer equity of access, I believe, across the country. Confidence is key. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The workup is an important process to increase safety, the safety of the person getting the transplant. You need to stay in touch while you're waiting and have active, not passive participation. Guidelines change. And the reason for showing you those three sets of guidelines is to show that the community has developed, the transplant community has changed. It's responded to evidence, although we don't have high quality evidence in a lot of areas, we have experiential evidence.